also with, for Sri Lanka. Okay, so Sri Lanka is only the 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 tip. The, the tip. I don't know. I don't even know how to say it because after that there was so much more news coming out of of uh, different churches around the world getting bombed, getting persecuted. Uh, but, uh, but Sri Lanka, yeah, we we heard last week got bombed. A lot of people died. Uh, guys, while we're here in Canada, let's not forget we are brothers and sisters in the rest of the world. Amen. Uh, Mark uh, and Janet, they shared their testimony last night. Um, they're like, yeah, we don't know if we will live tomorrow, let alone if we walk out in the night because there were persecutions happening in the Christian world in in northern part of Nigeria, right? You said northern part. And so for them to come to Canada and not have to all of a sudden wake up to a sound of bullet, that's a blessing. I mean, how many of you heard their testimony last night? It was beautiful. I hope that we can share it here again. And really puts into perspective. I mean, when we come and we complain about we're not starting on time, or the preacher is going, uh, preaching is going too long, man, go to Africa. Dang. We complain too much, man. And just, like, I remember when I went to Africa, I had to shut up about some of the things I complained about because it gave me perspective of being thankful about life. Pure, man. God have mercy on us. Christians in Canada, we have a lot to complain about. But we have testimonies here of people that, you know, had to pray, God, protect my family. I, don't, I, don't want, I want to see them. I want to see them. Okay, they're back home. Thank you, Jesus. You know, even I think you guys had to have, uh, hire security guards uh, in front of your church to make sure there's no bombers coming in, right? They're sitting right there. You want to know more? Just talk to them. And again, the testimonies are endless. But if you're not happy about being in Canada, go somewhere else and just come back and you'll have a different perspective. If I can give a harsh, straight-up rebuke, because, I'll, I'll, man, as a pastor, that's all I hear is complaints. In and out, left, right, and center. And I'm like, come on. Come on. Life is big. Jesus is big. We have so much to be thankful for being in Canada, man. So much more. Let's not complain about our lattes getting ruined. <laughs> Amen. So let's keep the churches around the world in prayer. Can we just pause just for a minute and pray for them? Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters. God, in Africa, in Sri Lanka, in India, in China, Indonesia, South America, all around the globe. God, who are being persecuted, bombed, bullets flying. Father, a lot of them are grieving right now for the loss of their loved ones. God, we pray comfort. We pray strength. Lord, we pray that even right now they will just sense, God, the warmth of your presence, knowing that you are with them during this time. And even when they have questions, only you can answer them. And Father, if there's any way that we as a church could support, could do anything, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom. You gave us a lot. Help us to give it to those that are in need. Thank you, Dad. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow. And even, of course, like the testimonies that Chris brought in, it it inspires you, right? It really puts things into perspective. So uh, uh, I said I would talk about one other event that's coming up in July, uh, July 3rd to 4th. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm bringing in a a crazy radical dude. (laughs) I don't know why, man. Of all, of all, you know, even the last Reformation, they were, they're pretty radical. You know, I said, God, but I want to ease things. You know, no, blam. You know, I, I get the ones that are rough and tough. And he's a missionary who, who, uh, who goes into, the, into the, the remote villages in Mexico and even across the globe. You know, recently I was trying to find out some information. He said, sorry, I just got out of the bush. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you more details you know, and he's constantly traveling, constantly go- going about. And so uh, through a good friend of mine in California, you know, got a hold of him. And he said, yes, I'm coming. Um, and he's not your typical preacher, three-point sermon and all nice and fluffy. He's a, he's, he's a roughneck. He, like he, he's rough around the edges, man. So be prepared to be kind of blown out of your mind. <laughs> if you're wondering who is this guy, his name is David Hogan. 
So David Hogan is coming to Shiloh Baptist Church, a uh, really radical guy, um, and he'll share stories of God's uh, God adventure, God adventure uh, that he walks when he walks with God, and what what is the adventure that he faces? Again, like every villager he, he goes to, there's a price on his head. They're ready to kill him, but he still goes and preaches the gospel and wins souls. Ain't that crazy? The bullet doesn't frighten him. He still goes and preaches. Uh, he, he might, I don't know if you'll share this, but I heard him share this one time where he went to preach and he knew those guys had guns and it was ready to take him out. But he was still going to go preach. And then he looked at his son and said, look, there's a shotgun in the back of my truck. If they start pulling out the weapons, start shooting and I'll start running. So, <laughs> so just imagine the guy <laughs> just running for his life, man. So, you know, he, he like that many, many stories. And wh why is he coming? It's not because just to add to your calendar. It's not that. It's to shake the things up. All right? God is bringing the most unusual people, the most unpolished preachers, the people that you will not even expect to come. And I, I, I say, God, yes. Honestly, I, w I did not expect him to say yes. I honestly didn't. You know, because it's all connections and all these things. I'm like, God, I'm not even connected. And the door opened. So the only thing we can do is say, God, whatever you want, do so. Do so. So that's in July, 3rd and 4th. And so anyone that's a good event planner, come talk to me. I'm not good at it. So I need help. <laughs> I need help. All right, church, you ready for the word? All right. I, uh, I, I might have to condense things down. I don't know, but uh, I'm going to try my best. Um, how many of you remember what we've studied so far? I mean, you don't have to say it. I'll, I'll try and do a recap. I'm going to make sure this balances and not falls. Um, how many of you remember the video on the spirit, soul, and body? Yeah? Okay. Um, let's do it now. Let's do it now. Let's show that video. Uh, and I won't take too long, but show that video, please. Spirit, soul, and body. There is a total transformation that has taken place on the inside of every person who becomes born again. Now you can see this in many places, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the scripture there says, If any person is in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the next verse says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto God by himself. The Lord has totally changed you. It says, old things have, past tense, passed away, all things, present tense, reality, right now, have become new. And all things are of God. Now, if you don't understand this concept of spirit, soul, and body, you are instantly setting yourself up for confusion and frustration and ultimately unbelief. Because you can tell by process of elimination that this is not talking about your physical body. If you were fat before you got saved, you'll still be fat after you get saved. Your body didn't instantly pass away and all things become new. And your soul is also not the part of you that got saved. Because if you were stupid before you got saved, you'll still be stupid after you get saved. If you were depressed, if you didn't know math before you got saved, you will still be depressed. And you just don't instantly know math after you get saved. The soul is not changed. So by process of elimination, you can say it's not your body and it's not your soul. And so that leaves your spirit. Your spirit is a part of you that got totally changed at salvation. When a person makes Jesus Christ their Lord, there is instantaneous change that takes place. And yet, that scripture in 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it isn't in process, but it's already done. It's an accomplished fact, a done deal. And if you don't understand that that change takes place in the spirit and has to work its way out into the soul and the body, then you are going to instantly come into unbelief and begin to say, but it didn't change. I'm still the same. And it may cause some people to seriously doubt whether they were ever saved, but your spirit is right now as perfect, as mature, as complete as Jesus is. But when you get born again, your spirit gets elevated 
it gets recreated to where it's literally, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, that God sends forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. It's literally, when you get born again, your spirit passes away. The old spirit is taken out. It dies, is what the scripture says in Romans chapter 6. And God places within you the spirit of his son. That's what it says again in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. It says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In other words, you aren't truly born again unless you receive God putting the Spirit of His Son in your heart. The Spirit of Jesus has come to live inside of every born-again person. And your Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus have intermarried, they've merged, they've become one, so that you are now a totally brand new person and the identity and the holiness, the makeup of your Spirit is identical to Jesus. John 4, 24, Jesus said this. He said, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He said, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. So how can holy God fellowship with unholy man? Even at our very best, we still fall short of God's standards. Well, the way it happens is, is that when you put faith in Jesus, you become born again, and in your spirit, you become a brand new creature that is righteous and holy. You are as pure and holy in your spirit as Jesus is because it's his righteousness that has been given unto you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it says that Jesus is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus has become our righteousness. And then as you get your soul in agreement with what is already transpired in your spirit, then you see the physical benefit. Your spirit has to flow through your soul to get into your body, into the physical world. The soul has a valve on it. And basically that is the function of your mind, your mental, emotional part, the soulish part of you. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead already indwells every born-again believer. But if your mind is like a valve and if it's closed to that, if it doesn't embrace that truth and renew its mind and get to where what you see in the Word of God, in the spiritual mirror, if that doesn't become more real to you than what you see in your physical mirror, then it's possible for this resurrection life that's in your spirit to be completely shut off, just like you would shut the valve on a faucet. And you say, but I feel sick. My body hurts. The doctor says I'm dying. Here's my medical record. And if those things dominate you, that soul can shut off that power so that not one drop of God's life-giving power ever touches your physical body. And you can die sick having the resurrection life of God on the inside of you. And of course, you can apply that to every area of your life. You can have depression in you. You can have uh, anger and bitterness when the whole time in your spirit there is love, joy, and peace, as it says in Galatians 5.22. So the critical part of you is actually the soul. And the rest of the Christian life is renewing of the mind and as we do that, then the physical body will experience the benefit. I think that's like three parts to it. So some of you are like, wait, you're missing something? We watched part one last week. So how many of you like learned something right there? Isn't that awesome? Praise God. And that's the thing. Oftentimes we look at ourselves in the mirror and we're like, man, I'm bald, I'm ugly, I'm fat, I'm this, I'm that. I mean, you almost like speak negatively over us, but then we need to look at the Word of God and see what the Spirit of God is speaking about. Man, man, I'm cutting in and out a lot, Mike. So, okay, so we saw, now where did I put my pens? Oh, right there. Good. Okay, so uh, just a quick recap. We saw that a couple of weeks ago, the Bible says anyone that's depending on the law to make yourself right is under a curse. We, we saw that in Scripture. We also saw that Jesus was an innocent. He was innocent. He, he didn't have any guilt. Man, I'm cutting a lot, a lot here. He, he, he 
but yet he became the curse. And how did he become the curse? He did not break a law. He was born in the law, right? But he did not break any law. So how on earth did he become a curse? Bible says, curse is everyone who hangs on the tree. So he became a curse for us. Okay, so we learned that. We also learned he became sin. In other words, it doesn't mean like he, he had to commit a sin to become a sinner. No, God treated him like as if he committed sin. And then nailed him to the cross. So we're looking at Jesus who, innocent, free from, free from anything, who was not guilty of sin, took our death sentence and nailed it to the cross and gave us life. But we also saw in water baptism last week about it is, it's not about being a church member. All right? Let me break, let me kill that sacred cow. Water baptism is not about church membership. Do you realize in God's kingdom there's no such thing as membership? You are a citizen of a king, of a kingdom. Okay, I understand. By the way, I understand church membership is for the um, non-profit organization. Yeah, I'm going to change mics. It's going to look like I'm swearing. You know, whether it's a bleep, whether it's a bleep. <laughs> so, I, I want to, I, the reason I'm killing a lot, a lot of sacred cows is because I want to see you free from the yoke of slavery. All right? You got to do this. You got to go to church. You got to do this, do this, do this, do this, so that you can be right. You do all of that. And if you don't have faith in God, faith in Jesus, man, you ain't going to go to heaven. You know, let's not even think about going to heaven, heaven coming down in us. Amen? So, Bible says, anytime you depend on the law to make you right, you are already under the curse. I met people say, but pastor, I, I pay my tithe, I, I give to the poor, I'm a good person, I follow the Ten Commandments. Yeah. I still aren't going to save you. It's not going to save you at all. So let's continue on, okay? Uh, the video is just a foundation, but we'll keep going. Uh, Matthew 22, 38 to 40. Jesus was encountered with this question. Let's read it. This is the first and greatest commandment, which was love the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, soul, and strength, right? So he said that. I, I missed that verse. Then he said, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Is it good? Okay, thank you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And now read this out loud, church. What do you say? All the law and the prophets, sorry, all on these two commandments hang all the law and the... All right. I'll, I'll go old school. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, so now I'm forgetting. What, okay, here you go. So there's the law, right? And then there's the uh, prophets. So it says, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself." And he's and Jesus said, "On these two commandments hang all the law and the." What's, what is the one word in those two commandments that you heard? I want red so you, it can distinguish. Okay? Love. So when you read the Old Testament and you see, you know, God being an angry God and all these things, whatever, Jesus said, love is the key that connects the law and the prophets. Man, I know people that ask me, but I can't believe God is so unjust. I can't believe God is unfair. I'm like, no. Read it through the lens of Jesus. If you, read, if you read the Bible through your own lens, man, you come up with funky theology and create your own Bible, man. I mean, how many cult and occult groups created their own little religion out of the Bible? So many. You got to read it from Scripture's point of view. Okay, now look, next Scripture verse. Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, all the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to what? 
fulfill. Okay, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one dot or one mark will pass from the law until all be fulfilled. So it's saying that the law is still there. Okay, it's not abolished. And this is where we run into like the, the extreme grace teaching. People saying, oh, the grace of God and I can just do whatever I want. You know, one preacher was, you know, who was teaching on grace a lot um, was confronted one day by a couple that was just living together versus being married. Oh, but God's grace, God's grace. And he's like, hold on, but that's not right. And they, he, they were like, no, but you teach God's grace, God's grace. So he went home and he read the book of Jude. I think it was Jude. And then he began to teach on holiness. <laughs> I tell you, man, we, we take things really, really far. Okay, therefore anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the, in the kingdom. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness, say this out loud, surpasses, man, what version is that? Okay, it's a different version. For I say to you that unless your righteousness, what's the word there? exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you're like, hold on, God. You're telling me now i got to work harder? You know, it sounds like it. Because now my righteousness got to be better than the Pharisees. But that is not... Oh, that's okay, man. It's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll go with what you got. <laughs> he, he's like, man, your righteousness should exceed them. Okay? So the problem with the Pharisees and the, you know, the Sadducees, who, who was always sad, and the scribes who only did the, the writing, <laughs> was they kept putting burdens on people. You got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, and you got to do this. Man, only to realize they, they put a yoke of slavery on their necks. And they were not uh, experiencing freedom at all. And here, Jesus shows up, the one who fulfills the law and brings in a completely new perspective, a heavenly perspective of the law and the prophets. Okay? So let's, let's keep going. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. You all read this before, right? Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Keep going. Take my, say this out loud, yoke. Okay, I know I've done this before. Anytime I read that, I was like, oh yeah, cast all your burdens unto the Lord and, you know, that kind of thing. But what he's saying is, take my instructions upon you. Because he was speaking to a, a Jewish nation, people living under the law with Pharisees who was just binding the law on their necks. All right, there were 613. You think there was 10 commandments? There were 613 laws that was binding people. And then Jesus shows up and it's like, who are you? What are you doing? All right? Take my yoke upon you. In other words, take my instructions upon you and what? Learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. How many want to rest, man? Rest from striving. Rest from, oh God, I messed up, I messed up, I messed up, I messed up. Hey, religion says I messed up, my dad is going to kill me. The gospel says I messed up, I need my dad. That's the gospel, that's the good news. Is when you mess up, you need your dad. You need your father. You need God. Amen. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. All right? So in, in Christ fulfilling the law, the, here, here's the problem. Us human beings, this is the big jar, by the way. <laughs> Every time, I know anyone sitting here, you're sort of cut off, but just imagine a big jar. So when we try to walk according to the law and the prophets, anytime we try to do things on our own strength, our jar is always half full or maybe even empty. Why? Because you can never fulfill it. Fulfill. Fulfill. 
I talked to my friend a year or two ago, and he said in, in, the, in the Jewish context, when Jesus came, he meant he filled the jar up all the way. In other words, you cannot live in the law and the prophets by yourself. You need Jesus. If the law was abolished, go ahead and steal. Go ahead and commit adultery. Go ahead and murder. Oh, because why? The grace of God. You hear me? We can go in one extreme, but in Christ, the law and the prophets are fulfilled. You remember the Mount of Transfiguration? When he went up there, who showed up? Moses and the law and the prophet. Jesus fulfilled it, all right? Now look at this, John chapter 8, 3 to 11. John chapter 8, 3 to 11. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made a stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. It says, what does it say? In the law, all right? Now they are judges. In the law. Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? All right, now, now in context, this happened in the outer court where Gentiles or women would gather, all right? So there is, in the temple, man, I'm just dropping stuff. Okay, so there is the outer court, the inner court, and then the Holy of Holies. So it was right here that they brought the woman in because no one else was allowed to go in. So they brought the woman in, in that, in the temple, in that area, and says, hey, let's catch Jesus in the act. Let's catch, catch him in, in what he's going to say. And see what he says, in the law. All right? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Man, the law always finds a way to accuse. So, man, yeah. But Jesus bent down, and what did he try to do? And started to write on the ground with his finger. Keep going. When they kept on questioning him, he strained her up and said, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. All right? So here Jesus was not trying to go, La, 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 I'm not listening to you. He's not doing that. Always look it into context. Always. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. Actually, let's go to John 7 first, and then we'll go to Jeremiah. John 7. John 7, please. Okay, this was before they brought the woman in. This is what happened. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Keep going. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Okay, this he said before this event happened. I think there's more. Yeah, keep going. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his word, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet. Others said, He is the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Man, they missed it. Does not the scripture say that the, that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided. Why? <laughs> Man, if you think Jesus is here to... Let's uni bring world unity and world peace. Man, the people were divided because of Jesus. He threw a curveball in there. Every time, what did Jesus say? I, I, I did not come to bring peace, but uh, divide the bone and the marrow, flesh and the spirit, right? Have you ever wondered when you begin, when you finally began to attend to the call of God? I'm not talking about being in ministry. I'm talking about your relationship with Him. All of a sudden, a certain group of people began to sort of vanish from your life? I'm talking about friends. I'm talking about influence. It's because of Jesus. 
If you want to keep your friends, let Jesus be on the closet, in the closet. If you love your friends, even Jesus said, if you do not hate your father, mother, brother, and sister more than me, you're not worthy. He's not saying that you go to your wife and say, I hate you. It's not meaning that. It's meaning, how much do you really love me? How much are you willing to follow me? That's why I said, when you call him Lord, is it your life or his life? Is it your command or his command? That's why I asked, is it a choice? When a king and a lord gives a command, do you say, well, I don't feel like it. Why am I off with his head? <laughs> Church, think about it. When you read scripture, the Bible even says, if you love me, you will obey. Obedience comes because of love. All right? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. I think there's one more verse. Verse 44. No? Okay. Now look at Jeremiah 17, 13. Oh, yeah. And some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Now look at Jeremiah 17, 13. Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Now read this out loud, church. Those who turn away from you will be written in the... So what was Jesus doing when they were trying to accuse the, the woman and put him in a trap? He was writing his, their names down. You're coming at him with the law. Jesus knows what the law says. He is the word. And he himself, and, and you wonder why. When he said, you know, anyone that's without sin, let him cast the first stone. And why did they drop the stone? Because they remembered watching him scribbling on that floor, on that ground. He's saying, those who turn away from you will be written in the... He used the law right back at them, church. <laughs> Man, I tell you, I want to be that smart. I am that smart because of the Holy Spirit, not because of me. <laughs> because they have forsaken the Lord. Now look what it says. The spring of living water. And in John chapter 7, they were divided when he said that I am the living water. Wow, church. When you follow Christ, yeah, get ready for, for some division happening. Get ready for some things to be pruned out of your life. Get ready for some friends to kind of say, can't stand you, you're too, you're too much like Christ. You know what? It's okay to look too much like Christ. Especially right now. It's totally fine. That's why you don't live looking at your physical body in the mirror. You look at the Word and see the Holy Spirit inside of you and let Him reflect the Father. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Father, that you are the living water. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. As you take this moment to, to reflect, you've lived your life for yourself. You became Lord. You were Lord. But today you want to let Jesus be Lord. I'm even talking to believers. Yeah. Sometimes we dethrone Christ out of our lives and say, no, 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 no. There's my plans. My way. It's going to be the way I do it, God. And then we find things not working. Frustration. Burdensome. Pressure. And then you pray, 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 and nothing's working. There's no prayers being answered. And you want, Lord, what did I do? Ask yourself. Ask yourself. Is He Lord or are you Lord? It is His plan or is it your plans? Is it His way or is it your way? Is He the one driving your car or is it you? He's got an amazing plan, an amazing purpose. But it is in Him. It's not anywhere else. And you've strayed away. If that is you, just, you can just put your hand on your chest and just say, God, forgive me. 
I've depend I've depended on my own understanding. I've depended on my own way. But today, Jesus, I surrender. Jesus, I surrender. Jesus, I surrender. You might feel regret because of some of the mistakes you've made. Let me tell you, it's not worth living in regret. It's not worth it. Let it go. Just let it go. He loves you. He loves you. Every mistake that you've made, don't worry. God will look at it and just say, "Don't worry. I'll take care of that." But today, are you willing to trust your savior? Are you willing to trust Jesus? And today, are you willing to look in his mirror and not your mirror? Could we stand please as we close here?